right, so my name is Brett Rice. Um, this is going to be the fifth episode of our our podcast here for Core Vision Financial Group today. Bo Browning is joining as a co-host, and we have a special guest, uh, Ryan Dietrich from LPL Research. Uh, join me in giving a warm welcome to our guest, Ryan Dietrich. Ryan is the chief market strategist for LPL Financial. He is widely sought after by financial media for his expertise and commentary. Mr. Dietrich has been a common guest on CNBC, Fox Business, and Bloomberg Television, and has been quoted in outlets such as the Wall Street Journal, Business Week, USA Today, Reuters, and the Associated Press. Mr. Dietrich received a BA in finance from Xavier University and an MBA in finance from Miami University and he has earned his Charter Market Technician designation. He clearly has an impressive resume. Uh, Ryan, can you tell our audience, uh, you know, a little bit about yourself and what a Chartered Market Technician is? Absolutely. First off, guys, I do want to say thank you so much for having me. The fifth one. So I'm one of the first ones ever. So that's awesome. I look forward to hopefully doing some more in the future if, if, if this goes well. But a Chartered Market Technician, uh, well, CMT, Chartered Market Technician, most people know what a CFA is, right? Look at balance sheets and income and growth, things like that. A chartered market technician is a little bit different where you're looking kind of at price action and market sentiment and things like that. And as we do this discussion here this afternoon, you'll see kind of how I look at the world. I'm not your average market strategist where I just say, well, stocks are cheap and the economy strong, so it means this. I'm kind of like, well, let's dig a little deeper and kind of look back at the past history to see some type of potential path for where we could be going. Believe me, there's no right way to do it, um, but I, I think you know, kind of molding, looking at market technicals with the fundamentals, I think is a, is a really solid way, at least how I've made my career, and um, look forward to chatting about uh, how we see the world at LPR Research here real soon. Awesome, awesome. Oh, uh, I'm, I'm Bo Browning, right and uh, uh, I'm co-hosting today with Brett, and um, I've, I've followed Ryan now for, for quite a few years on Twitter and always love the content, so for any of our uh, followers or customers, um, if there's somebody that um, I could recommend for you to follow that has uh, some neat insight on the market, maybe different takes and historical uh, numbers and, and market metrics, uh, I would give Ryan Dietrich a, a follow. So um, we're glad to have you here, your insight, uh, especially as we're focusing on, on um, October with a election coming up. Um, our focus today is politics uh, and the market. So after last night's debate, or whatever you want to call it, we'll uh, <laughs> move into some of the content here. Um, and we appreciate what LPL Research has put out, including yourself, uh, over the last month or two um, in regards to election cycles. Um, uh, and, and we want our um, customers to understand uh, from that content why we recommend uh, that even through a turbulent election cycle that you should likely stand pat in your investments. Of course, you always want to review allocations that, in according to your risk tolerance and time horizon, but in, in, as the election impacts markets, uh, that shouldn't have much effect on what people do um, in their overall portfolios. So um, without, uh, with, without further ado, let's dive right into question number one. Um, Ryan, so looking at the makeup of our executive and legislative branches, why do you think a split Congress, often referred to as a stalemate or gridlock, has historically been most bullish for, for stocks? Well, Bo, I think it's almost as simple as the best Washington is one that can't get anything done. <laughs> you think about it, we've got this split Congress this year, okay? Stocks I know were down a ton back in March. Now we're positive for the year. The last 10 times we had a split Congress in Washington, this goes back to the early 80s, the S&P was higher every single time. You go back to World War II, when you have a split Congress during that calendar year, the S&P gains over 17% on average. And again, it's kind of checks and balances, right? Like our, like our forefathers wanted things, not too much power one way or the other. Um, you know, when you get too much power one way, that's when maybe you get some more extreme measures put in and maybe that can upset the apple cart potentially. But you know, when you look at the split Congress we've had this year and last year for that matter, um, that those have been potential positives. And as we head into this election season out into next year, our base case at LPL Research is still, we're probably gonna 
have a split Congress. We can get into some of the details, nuts and bolts, why. We think this election is probably much, much closer than some of the polls uh, would suggest. And if you have a split Congress at the end of the day, we all want to vote for who we want to vote for. But if you have a split Congress, uh, you know, when we wake up in November, whatever day we get the results, might not be the next day anymore. But sometime in November, we get those official results. A split Congress is what someone probably wants from their investments point of view. And again, it's as simple as checks and balances, can't get too much done and too much power one way or the other. And markets kind of like that. Perfect. Thank you for that info. Um, that's that's what we've been stressing to clients. And, uh, um, you know, it's, it's crazy to think Washington can't get anything done. It's better for my money. But that's the reality. Go ahead, Brett data for stocks from the last 70 years, what impact do elections have on returns in the near term, the three to six months following an election? Well, guys, the honest truth is not that much, okay? If you look historically ahead of an election, so well, clearly we're in that boat right now, September and October historically are weak months in election year. Something to be aware of, October is the worst month of the year during an election year. Why is that? Probably just a little skittishness, right? You got to, you know, potentially a new president some years, but or the same president, but just the markets hate uncertainty. And there's uncertainty coming clearly ahead of an election. So you get a little bit of a sell-off. But what, what happens? What, what does the book tell us tends to happen once that election and that uncertainty is removed? You tend to get a pretty strong rally in November and December. And interestingly, you know, the first year of the presidential cycle, um, you know, if President Trump were to win again, you tend to get a really big bounce that next year if you have a president coming back. And again, I think it's as simple as the market knows what it's going to get, right? When you have new leadership, there's potentially some changes that could come in and some uncertainty. But markets tend to be okay with uh, the guy they just had for four years, because whether you love him or hate him, you kind of know what you're going to get. Uh, but the bottom line there, a little weakness ahead of an election and then a rally after makes sense. And, and I want to build on this just for a second. I don't know if this, <laughs> the question was coming like this. Whoever wins this election is going to get the keys to a really strong economy. Okay. The consumer confidence number just came out yesterday. It came in way above expectations. Consumer makes up two thirds of the economy. You look at manufacturing, which is soaring. Uh, housing data is like breaking records. Okay. This there's uh, now I know the other side of things. Disney just laid off 28,000 people. We're not saying this economy is fully, fully coming back, but there are parts of this economy that are really strong, which make us think that the recession is in the rear view mirror. And as we move forward with better therapeutics and likely vaccine here the next couple of months, that's only going to open this economy up. And whoever Whoever the president is, is going to be in the driver's seat to something pretty good. And what matters more for investments is how the economy is doing, not who is in Washington. I want to really stress that. Okay. Yeah, and that travel and leisure may be one of the lagging things to come back, especially as during this specific period, we're also dealing with a pandemic. So um, right. can I ask you also just ancillary uh, question, if we don't have an election result on November 3rd or 4th, is that the wrench that could could drive us lower possibly until we do have a result? Um, how, how will that maybe impact us? And again, I would say that you're likely to answer long term. It's, it's probably negligible right. because at some point we'll have a winner, but maybe in that right. those few days that we don't. Oh, market's probably not going to like it. You look back at history, there have been very few times we've had a contested election. 2000 is the perfect example where after that election in early November, you know, there were no election results until officially December 12th. S&P 500 bottomed about, or bottom, bottomed, S&P sold off about 6% over those five, five and a half weeks or so. And it's that uncertainty factor. Apparently there was a contested election back in 1960 as well, but I don't think stocks reacted as much and it was shorter. So the truth is again, markets don't like uncertainty and should we have the, um, you know, back and forth, whoever wins and whoever loses and then lawsuits and arguments, uh, market might not like that. And I wouldn't be shocked, well, we wouldn't be shocked at all if there was uh, some sell-off. And you mentioned kind of, you know, the travel and leisure area. I want to build on something for just a quick second. After the tech bubble in 2000, the group that really did poorly for the next decade was technology. After the financial crisis, the group that's really underperformed ever since then is financials, right? Banks, the scene of the crime, the previous two times have really underperformed. And that kind of leads to where we're going in now. You know, your hotels, your airlines, your cruise ships. I mean, some of those, there's going to be winners there. Don't get me wrong. But if, if Mark Twain said history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes, if that happens again, some of the scene of the crime uh, this time that have been impacted really might take years to, um, to kind of get back to um, where they just were back in February is the sad, honest truth. 
Okay. 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 Yeah, that, that that is a little bit of a rough picture, at least for that part, part of the market. But uh, thank you for that info as well. Um, what should investors be focused on if they're worried about the election in general? Well, you know, I mean, there's a lot of different ha- angles on this. I think the best way to put it is focus on the long term. I mean, you know, if you think about it, the S&P 500 just had a vicious, vicious bear market, okay? The last part of March, and we're down 34%, and, and you know, people are calling you guys wondering what's going on and how much lower can it go, and the bond market's getting killed, and gold is honestly getting killed. Sometimes markets have a funny way when everyone's on one side, the worst scenarios are out there, but the worst thing doesn't happen, right? We, we can avoid the comment one more time and markets go higher. Every 20 year period, stock prices are higher, okay? And you think about it also, um, it's just, you know, we just, we we'll probably just exited a recession. The average expansion is about five years, okay? Five years of economic growth. If we just started a new expansion sometime over the past month or so, or maybe two months, which is what we think here at LPL Research, this expansion really could have a lot more life left to it. And again, you can have volatility, you can have pullbacks, but during times of expansion, that tends to be when stocks do better. So from a big picture point of view, I think it's just so important for investors to take that longer term approach and realize it was devastating what has just happened and is still happening to our country and our world. But from an investment's point of view, there could still be a lot of life left and a lot of gas in the tank uh, for, for potentially higher equity prices here. Good stuff, Ryan. Hey, uh, what market performance indicators historically stand out the most during an election cycle? Well, you know, there's a few. I mean, people always talk about who's going to win the election and how can you tell? Uh, You know, one we like to talk about is stocks. Simply put, if stocks are up or down three months before an election, that tends to predict the winner. Here's what I mean. If stocks are down three months before the election, that's the S&P 500 when I say stocks, um, the incumbent party tends to lose. If stocks are up, the incumbent party tends to win. It's worked 87% of the time since uh, the Great Depression. Think about 2016. Everyone thought Hillary Clinton was going to win. The Dow had a nine-day losing streak directly ahead of the election. And copper, more of an industrial metals, President Trump play at the time, 14-day win streak, okay? So the stock market wasn't buying what people were selling. And now you look, stocks once again are higher. You got to start that clock on August 3rd. That's three months before the election. After the rally we've seen the last couple of days, stocks once again are higher. So we think that's maybe kind of in the corner of President Trump. If, if we could put it this way, we get a big rally in October. That might be the market's way of potentially suggesting President Trump. Flip side of this. Recessions are election, um, re-election killers, okay? We've had four recessions since the Great Depression. A president up for re-election who had a recession ahead of the election lost every single time. People tend to vote with their pocketbook and how their job is going, and that, that tends to, so you got kind of both sides of this, what I'm getting at. Um, so it's really a unique situation, clearly, in 2020. But those are two that we really like to look at, and I think we'll really focus on that stocks one. If stocks are going up or down, that might be the market's way of telling us, you know, if it's comfortable or a little apprehensive, if you will, over who might be in the uh, White House, um, you know, I guess, officially come next January. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you for that as well. Um, sure. Ryan, let's ask you, I'm going to fire a couple of questions. If you, if you forget um, one or two of these scenarios, I can repeat it. But we tend to view policy effect on individual sectors rather than the overall market post-election. And thus, our question is, in your opinion, in your opinion, what sectors would react most positive or negative if Trump were reelected? Which areas would react positive and negative if Biden were elected? And lastly, with a Republican sweep seemingly off the table, if there were a Democratic sweep, which sectors might perform best? Yeah, uh, the great great questions there. So we'll, I'll just kind of go one bit at a time. We'll talk about uh, if, if President Trump were to win the re-election. I mean, you think about it, energy and financials are two groups that have seen deregulation. They should continue to see deregulation. Those are two that are potentially positive. Now, I get it. The last four years, we've had deregulation in energy and financials, and those groups have obviously underperformed, but those are still um, more positives. You think about also um, utilities, communication services, financials, consumer discretionary, all of those could get hurt 
potentially by a Joe Biden corporate tax increase from 21 to 28 percent. So it's not like Trump is better for him, but maybe Trump is less bad for those particular groups. Also, for-profit prisons and for-profit education are two other groups that histor- that should do a lot better um, should President Trump potentially win. And we also think technology. We think you know, the Democratic side of things might be a little tougher on technology, so they could do a little bit better under President Trump. But honestly, for the last four years, technology has done great, and, and I don't think too much is going to change there. So that's one way to look at it. On the, on the Democratic side of things, if um, Joe Biden were to win, infrastructure, right? We heard about infrastructure four years ago. It really hasn't happened. We think with all the spending that's going on, if the Republicans win, we yeah, we might get an infrastructure bill sometime soon, uh, but it'll be smaller. If the Democrats win, an infrastructure bill is likely there, and that can help cyclicals. If you look back, our friends at Ned Davis did a study. When you have a Democrat win and, and they're in office for the first year, one of the best groups after that scenario is cyclicals. So you think about like materials and industrials, some of those cyclical value names have been beaten up but are doing better all of a sudden if the economy keeps opening up. That's an area we'd look at. And then the big ones, obviously, renewable energy. We know the green, I mean, there's a lot of money going to go into green energy should, um, should Joe Biden win. So that's absolutely a positive there. And this one's a little contrary, but guns. I mean, gun stocks really should do well if Joe Biden wins because you know more rules and regulation are likely coming. So it's kind of contrary, but it's just kind of how um, that plays out. And then also the last one I'll say, you know, with, with, with Joe Biden, I mean, the tariffs that we've all talked about, those big tariffs that the U.S. still has on China, I'm not saying those are going to go totally away, but they're probably going to come down and it could be more of a positive potentially for China in general in a Chinese stock market should Joe Biden uh, win. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Well, we appreciate your time today. We really do. Um, any other questions that you have uh, here at the end, Brett? Anything you've been wanting to ask Ryan while we have him on here? Sorry about that. Uh, I just want to make sure, Ryan, you understand, we use those charts that you guys produce at LPL Research all the time, you know, to gather information that when we're sitting down with clients, we can say, hey, look, historically, you know, different presidents, markets have performed, you know, this way and showing people that stuff, you know, I think has really helped give us a position of knowledge when setting with clients. So, yeah, thank you guys very much for producing that information. Yeah, thank uh, you. Well, you're yeah. very welcome. I'm, I'm honored to be here. Just real quickly, you know, in 2008, we had a big rally for eight years. People didn't like President Obama, but the market went up. The last four years, we've had like 150 new highs. People didn't like President Trump. Maybe they weren't as invested as they should be. Just remember, politics and your investments don't always match. And a lot of times they don't jive at all. So it's very hard to separate the two. But for people who are worried about this election, which way it's going to go, it's very important. I know you guys are telling your clients this. Don't panic if the person you want doesn't win. Because again, history would tell us if the economy is strong, stocks likely will be strong as well. Yep. Yeah. And, and again, history, I like what you say about history repeating itself. Those that tend to stand pat and, and you know, focus on, on their balance of their portfolio or those long-term goals tend to perform better than, than us who would overreact. Any of us, I mean, we're human, right? So we throw emotion in there. And as soon as we react to something, we could possibly, uh, you know, it could possibly be a detriment to our, to our portfolio. So again, Ryan, we appreciate your help. Um, and and per, it, the LPL research team, you specifically, um, you know, providing all the content that you do uh, for us and then uh, for our clients as well. So thank you again. Uh, guys, they, they say the stock market's the only place where things go on sale and people run out of the store screaming. <laughs> I think that's true. That, that's what we've seen throughout history. So the next time there's a 20 or 30% correction, I know it's extremely scary, but longer term investors need to use that as an opportunity. But I'm, I'm a huge fan, guys, of Core Vision Financial Group. I love what you guys are doing. I'm honored to be here today. All of, you, all of your listeners and all of your clients are in very, very good hands and LPL Research is here for anything you guys need. So thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, thank you, Ryan.